Hi, Jora. How you doing? Are you staying safe? <laughs> hey, Lanier. Uh, I'm, I'm doing my best, uh, although it's, it's a bit of a funny thing to think about what staying safe even means right now in our, in our current world. I guess that is a weird uh, way of being since uh, all the people around us seem to carry danger with them in this uh, epidemic conditions that we're in. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a funny thing when you think about it, right? We're all ending our conversation, signing off with this bit of advice, and actually, when you reflect on uh, what safety might even mean in a in a pandemic where the people around us are sort of simultaneously uh, the biggest threat to us and also uh, more of a source of security and, and people we need to depend on maybe more than ever. It's a kind of interesting uh, opportunity to think about uh, something important, I think, in the, in the way in which we relate to one another. What's, uh, what's that? Why do you think it's important generally about the way we relate to each other? Well, uh, I mean, you, you might think um, this is a, a kind of an acute uh, example of a much more general feature of our condition as people who are kind of uh, dependent and vulnerable to one another and for whom uh, a certain amount of dependence is uh, not even just a bad thing, but a, but a necessary thing and even a good thing for us, a, an essential part of how living our lives well uh, ends up looking when we when we do it well, and I you know I think a lot about this uh, because I'm a philosopher who's especially interested in issues about trust and dependence on one another, and um, it it's a kind of uh, enduring and somewhat paradoxical feature of uh, of what we seek when we uh, seek trust and and try to stand in relations of trust with others that there's this kind of internal tension. Uh, between um, making ourselves uh, vulnerable to others, putting ourselves in their hands and relying on them to, to keep us safe, relying on uh, them for our safety, uh, and at the same time, um, making sure that we take care of ourselves and, and look out for our own safety. Um, well, explain that, explain that to me a little bit more, because I mean, if I trust somebody, isn't that the most safe position I can be in? Because after all, I can trust them. And isn't that exactly what I need in order to be safe? Yeah. I, so, I mean, I think it is in a way exactly what you need in order to be safe. But what's in a way paradoxical or at least a little puzzling about it is that the route to trust uh, is a little different. The kind of safety or security we achieve in trusting people is a little different than other routes to rendering ourselves safe and secure. And one kind of quick way to get on to this point. So, um, you know, think about it like this. If I were to say to you, hey, Lanier, what, what makes you so sure that you can trust this person? And you responded to me by saying, well, um, I've actually hired a private investigator and have uh, had her followed for the last three weeks. And I've read through all of her emails and I've got a camera set up in her living room. Uh, so I'm really confident that actually I'm safe in her hands. I mean, in a way, what you've done has shown me that you don't trust her at all, right? And yet these sorts of methods of, you know, sort of trying to predict and strategically figure out what people are likely to do, um, they're a kind of natural route to safety or at least to predictability when it comes to other people in some realms. And yet when it comes to sort of wanting to trust people, they look like they're positively counterproductive. If what I'm searching for is the kind of security that comes with being able to say, yeah, I really trust this person and that's why I feel safe with them. I can't rely on, uh, on a bunch of data and evidence that I might go seeking in that way. Yeah, I guess we're not really trusting our fellow humans in these times of pandemic. Mm -hmm. Instead, we're making sure that they can't reach us by staying in some other city and communicating only by Zoom conversation instead of in person. Uh, well, there, does that there, mean our trust has collapsed here? I worry about that. Um, I mean, there's a certain amount of 
that, right? Um, one of the ways in which we need to keep ourselves safe is to avoid the sorts of dangerous person-to-person -person contact with one another uh, that might, you know, make it more likely that the virus spreads among us. On the other hand, it's quite clearly the case that we also really need to be able to rely on one another, each of us to do our part in, um, in following the advice of the public health community and doing all that stuff that we're all doing, washing our hands and staying six feet apart and using our hand sanitizer. And that um, we're really also seeing the ways in which um, even as we're physically distanced from one another, um, the degree to which we're depending on one another to, to take care of each other in these ways is, is as enhanced as it ever is. Yeah, so I guess that, I guess that is, I guess that is true. We are totally trusting other people to do their part in maintaining the, the hygiene measures that actually keep us bodily separate and prevent infection. And if we try to use uh, snooping and police measures to enforce them, they become less effective. So I do get that. Um, uh, we need social trust to make that work. Um, so is it right that uh, epidemic conditions are sort of a, uh, an especially uh, telling and salient manifestation of the basic condition that we all have to be in if we uh, are going to trust one another? I mean, both of the sides that you characterized are really there. So on the one hand, we have to, we, we are vulnerable to each other and our vulnerability is made more obvious and heightened by the fact that we will get the disease from other people if we contract it. And on the other hand, effective measures to fight against it depend on social cooperation. And the only way to secure that cooperation is actually to extend a hand to trust the other person and believe without knowing that they are going to wear their mask or have washed their hands or not come out in public if they have a fever and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I, um, I think this is maybe just one of many ways in which the pandemic brings into sharp relief features of our kind of mutual interdependence that are there all the time operating in the background and that when we really start to look at them show that there's a, a real tricky thorny kind of problem that we have to negotiate in order to succeed in living with others and uh and doing so in a way in which what you might think of as these kind of two countervailing or opposing tendencies one the the kind of the tendency to want to try to keep ourselves safe by focusing on the ways in which other people are or potentially a threat to us and needing to kind of um, you know manage that threat and minimize the degree to which we might be vulnerable to them if they prove untrustworthy that's a that's a sensible thing to do up to a point and then at the same time recognizing that none of us can survive on his or her own and that we're deeply dependent on others for just about everything that we need. And that indeed that kind of dependence is not just, so to speak, a necessary evil. It's not just that, um, you know, I kind of couldn't navigate my way through the world because I'd be incapable of lifting all the heavy rocks or killing all the fast animals by myself. There's a, there's a kind of deeper point, which is that um, without this kind of security and connection that comes from being able to trust other people, I'd, I'd be kind of completely isolated in a, in a very lonely and unpleasant and cold world. Okay, okay. But, uh, so uh, when you were saying the first side, it really made me think, okay, yeah, so maybe this vulnerability to other people, maybe we're stuck with that, but wouldn't it be better if we could just be actually secure and not have to depend on these other people that we don't even know and uh, don't have any history with? And now you're trying to tell me that 
uh, this is actually good for me and that I should not complain about the crappy condition that my uh, finite human <laughs> existence has left me in. He's, he's, so what's supposed to be good about it? What, say more about why you think this is actually a good thing for us. Well, I think it's in a way a great question and one that I don't have a, a quick and concise answer to. I can certainly point out that um, much of our lives would make little sense to us if it were really truly the case that vulnerability to other people were always a kind of necessary evil and a kind of cost to be born and, and minimized. Um, certainly when you think about what we seek in our closer, more intimate interpersonal relationships with other people, and this is, a, I think, kind of comes out in that first kind of silly example that I asked you, right? I mean, what we're seeking is a kind of sense of security or safety that essentially involves the recognition of our deep vulnerability to others, and then a sense that um, being uh, in relations of trust with others, where our vulnerability is uh, treated in the right sort of way by them is actually a positive good in our lives. Now, there's a question about how far we want to extend that circle. Is it okay to live a life in which I trust the members of my own household, but not the people next door? Should I be trying to trust the people next door, but not down the block, maybe in my city, but not on the other side of the country? But in a way, I think once you start asking those questions, it becomes hard to resist the idea that um, a life in which there's quite a bit of trust as a means to negotiating this problem of on the one hand, vulnerability and dependence, on the other hand, the need to uh, kind of live a life of security um, is, a, is a thing that we often see ourselves as having reason to, to seek out and cultivate in, in deeper and richer ways. Yeah, when you put it that way, talking about trusting the people on your block and then the people in your town and maybe the people on the other side of the country, it does um, bring home how much we need it in our public life and not just in our personal life. It seems like a big part of the trauma that we're undergoing as a global society comes from the breakdown of that kind of trust where we're not able to trust the people on the other side of the country to be doing the right thing by us and they're not trusting us to do the right thing by them. And in the absence of that social trust, we're in a position of uh, uh, intractable conflict instead of social cooperation. Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's worth spending some time um, reflecting on the, the ways in which we might be able to do a little bit better on this score. I mean, trust is one of these uh, funny things that philosophers often stumble in their thinking about because on the one hand, it's not the sort of thing that we can do on command or at will. We can't just tell ourselves, ah, trust would be good in this situation. I'm going to do it. And at the same time, it's not as though it's the sort of thing that we're completely powerless when it comes to forming trust. We, we can direct our attention to trying to cultivate more of it. We can be a bit more active in trying to counter the distrustful tendencies when we notice them coming up. We can think about other ways of interpreting people's behavior that make them out to be more decent and trustworthy rather than less. Um, we can kind of take a little bit more of an active role in combating what might be the sources of distrust and cynicism and pessimism that um, admittedly it's very hard not to succumb to in, in the world as it is right now. Yeah. So that makes me think, I mean, the, the lessons of this last quarter and trying to interact with everybody over Zoom, all those nice pieces of advice you just gave, you know, come down to something like, well, look, you have to make an effort to make yourself vulnerable, to reach out an open hand and expect that the person is not going to bite it, but is instead going to clasp it. And, and in real life, when we're in interpersonal interaction with each other, 
we rely on all kinds of emotional cues that we yes. pick up on because of the in-person bodily presence of one person to another. That's right. And we don't have that full set of cues over Zoom. And so we can't always tell when we're, when it's a good idea yeah. to yeah. pursue that open strategy. And I've seen a bunch of cases this quarter, man, a bunch of cases where people got off on the wrong foot because they couldn't um, hear where the other person was coming from over this artificial isolating social interface and ended up stopping trusting each other and then assuming bad motives and then things yes. spiraled out of control in a negative direction. Yeah. I guess in this world where we're all got to communicate on Zoom, we need to be able to give each other a little more rope than usual so that we can get the positive cycle of trust going instead of the negative cycle of distrust. I, I think that's got to be right. And um, I think this point that you're emphasizing in a way that so much of this is about um, a, a kind of basic feeling that we have in the presence of others and that many of our uh, routes to cultivating it rely so much on um, being in one another's presence and that we, we need to be quite aware of the degree to which it's going to be more of a challenge than it might have otherwise been. Um, you know, uh, maybe if I were in the same room as you, I could just kind of pick up on the signals that it was okay to roll on my back and show you my belly, so to speak, like the, <laughs> like the animals do. Uh, but yeah. that in this kind of alienated medium uh, and increasingly, I mean, but here again, you might think um, this is an example where the situation of the pandemic is just showing us in very sharp relief, something that was anyway true that, um, you know, as people relate to one another in ways that are more and more mediated by uh, technology and by the sorts of things that we're now all using to communicate with one another and to try to figure out what what these people on the other side of the country or for that matter the other side of the political aisle are thinking and doing and what's motivating them that uh, a lot of the cues that we might have been relying on were we sort of in more personal a proximity to them are are not there and hard to pick up on and we have to be aware of that and aware of the tendency to uh, to slide quite imperceptibly but but uh, inevitably into, into as you said this this kind of alternative road of distrust yeah I miss it I miss being able to hang around with you Jora <laughs> it's I miss being able to hang around with you linear, although, uh, you know, here we are utilizing the technology and hopefully getting a little practice at picking up on some of that uh, personal connection that, uh, that it is harder to get in this way. So maybe we trust each other a little more than we did before because of this. So that's a good note to end on. I hope you stay safe, Jora. Yeah, I hope you stay safe too, Lanier. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Talk to you. Bye.